Hello everyone, today we talk about the Transcaucasian, especially Georgian, Armenian and Caucasian Albanian warfare between the 10th and the 13th century, right? A broader outlook, I already made a video about medieval Georgian warfare for that matter between roughly the same time period. So as you know, uh, I actually I'm doing this uh, Eurasian steps series now to, to just focus on this region in function of those steps, let's say influences in this case, because we're not looking really at nomadic uh, warfare um, as such, right? However, influence within this perspective and with, with important connections that as we've seen existed between the nomadic and the sedentary space. Uh, it's not the first time we see medieval Caucasian warfare, nor uh, ancient, uh, the ancient one. Um, so there are lots of continuities, in a sense, uh, in pre-industrial times in these areas. They're fundamentally feudal uh, in nature, and as you will see, the area is quite uh, fragmented. It is a big frontier, right, really between the Byzantine Empire, the Caliphate slash Seljuk Empire, the same steps, uh, and also, you know, other areas, like as these peoples had contacts with naturally more faraway places, as we could appreciate, uh, there was surely a, a Western influence, right, uh, managing to, to arrive there, but also a lot of Central Asian one, also broader uh, Middle Eastern one, naturally being uh, very strong. Um, and as a frontier, naturally, it was um, the... You know, the, the, there was no real political stability uh, to it, right? Because all these powers interfered uh, in the region. That, however, exactly between the 10th and the 13th century, so the heyday of uh, its own culture and development. Like, you know, within the, the all the other great medieval civilization peak uh, at this point, you have, especially under Georgian power, fundamentally a, a uh, a strong um, consolidation, uh, right, uh, in, in the region, right, that affords further, you know, structure and, you know, direction to, to, be, to be affirmed, even after, uh, for, uh, after the, the 14th century crisis to partly uh, remain. Um, there existed a state of constant warfare, between the rulers uh, of the Abkhaz, fundamentally in, in, in the west, on the Black Sea, and some Georgian realms, right, the Armenian kingdoms and principalities, the rulers of Caucasian Albania, also known as Aran, right, not to confuse the, the uh, H-A-R-R-N, but without the H, like the, the Syrian power uh, in the south, we're talking um, essentially, of uh, of an area that today is part uh, of Azerbaijan, but at the time was considered properly Iranian, between uh, Ganja, Partav, and that uh, had been Islamicized um, already, but was fundamentally, uh, in fact, Iranian and you know Persian influences through the Arab Islamic rulers. Um, uh, in nature, as we will see, it's a fascinating uh, corner province of this mosaic, as you can see even from the from the political maps. Um, the Shahs of Shirvan, that had basically the same uh, constitution as such, like being a, um, an Iranian persified power, then the emirs of uh, the Indian Gizid dynasty. Uh, and, and many others, the only truth, so that today we do not have the time to simply descend it. And, of course, there was a lot of uh, commonalities between all these people. Um, the, the latter, for example, were more, uh, you know, stretching across, even in the north, in Cisco-Caucasia, uh, the, the, the coast of, of the Caspian Sea. They had a greater step influence they checked at some point even Georgian power so again it was all a policy of, of, of balance that as we've seen had been going on for quite a while um, for Iran proper the Caucasian Albania is um, is a bit of a you know, overlooked 
country, right? The present day Azerbaijan uh, Republic, um, uh, except the Nakhichevan area, has nothing to do with the historical Azerbaijan. This is an area of Iran, right? Iran was only given the name of Azerbaijan in, in the 20s of the 20th century, by the way. Um, so the main strength of the armies, especially of the uh, prevalently Christian states uh, of the region, so Armenia, Georgia, uh, was of course their cavalry. These cultures had been from kind of the, the, the dawn of, of, of history uh, in the area quite um, solidly uh, built feudal powers in, in nature. Right, the the terrain being quite, as you know, difficult. There are lots of mountains, and some areas are very harsh, also in weather, etc. There are some valleys, some important lakes, um, and in the, it, it's an impervious territory to cross. So, in, in general, the main problem for any ruler was arriving there was the impossibility of having a strong direct rule all over these areas that could simply become tributaries slash subjects this kind but could hardly be you know occupied directly in every place and uh, even at that point held uh, without a consistent level of decentralization with mean, your officials that still had to rule on a uh, on a local nobility or a local population where some kings uh, and their uh, their their vassals, let's say, were not particularly uh, obedient. They mostly uh, got together at any time they had a chance to increase, uh, grandize their own power in the meanwhile. But th this, uh, let's say, region has an incredibly intricate, um, also dynastic history, which highlights how the power was really dispersed in the hands of a very, you know, very kind of bold, by the way, and somehow proud nobility that was entrenched in, in their own uh, fortifications scattered all over this, this territory. Um, so cavalry akin to the contemporary, let's say, European one, right, say not differing dramatically in, in, in nature in role, right, more or less, again, but of center peoples of Europe, the Mediterranean, fight practically uh, in the same way, uh, except with certain characteristics. From from one side, we've seen it socially, like also other, in other cultures, this was a privileged military nobility that embodied substantial uh, equestrian uh, traditions. Again, this sense that albeit the land was sedentary, as we will see now, there was... Um, particularly strong um, steps bias that had just been cumulated because it was that easy to call uh, other uh, war bands in from from the steps, right, to, say, thicken your ranks and kind of, you know, stamming the, the locals. So this was a relatively to the resources of the land, a quite warlike um, region. Uh, that, of course, was um, activated in this sense again by the, the nobility retinues, constituted also by stepped horsemen. That would be on, on the longer run, settled down, and you know, of course, they would they would centralize and so on. But leaving in many fighting styles and equipment, etc., these stepped influence, um, as there were surely steps. Uh, nomadic raids in this land. This had always been the thing, right? Across the Caucasus, you have basically steps. Like at this point, we've seen that that, that world, uh, especially in these centuries before the, four, the 13th to 14th, but the Mongols change again a lot. Then there is the crisis um, of the, the mid 14th century. There are some areas that revert a bit more to, to the step uh, in a way, but we've seen that from antiquity, just north of the Caucasus, there were also substantially um, sedentary, you know, populations that were also very, in that case, even more exposed to steppes uh, influence, but um, still acting as sort of middleman, right? Um, especially for 
you know, uh, contributing to the to trade uh, and uh, in this sense, the, the, the spread like of material culture, especially from the more advanced south, to the steps, hands, and so this necessity also of peoples like we've seen it with the Khazars, with the with the Caliphate that crosses uh, the Caucasian mountains to essentially dislodge part of them from from just uh, the the northeast of the region on the Caspian um, and pushing them further north um, had uh, tendentially uh, weighed and uh, wagon and um, settled down to to an extent. Um, the uh, Christian Armenian Georgian uh, nobiliar cavalry uh, was naturally also very heavy. Right, uh, and accompanied by mounted archers that helped uh, their movements on a more difficult, um, on such difficult terrain, and uh, generally speaking, paving their way right, for the clash of this chivalric epos that was heavily influenced now by, by very different cultures. As we will see now, the Byzantine one, the Persian one, the um, the, the 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 Arab one, the the, the steppes one. So all cultures that in a way or another had turned very um, equestrian in uh, in nature right toward it had been heading towards a feudal one with the saddle jerks uh, to like bringing again that further um, mounted um, bias uh, with, to, to the caliphate and uh, intent just being the, the most powerful presence uh, Together with the Byzantine Empire uh, in in the in the region, as Christians, the Armenians and the, or the Georgians were naturally closer to the latter, to the Byzantine Empire. That at this point is also re-extending further east, reactivating uh, around Armenia, especially the Van Lake. You know, the, all the, the invasion of the Euphrates Valley, um, the the same battle massacred. Um, uh, with the, the Turks of Alparslan would be fought there, and so there, there is actually a wave also of Caucasian peoples, by the way, it is often uh, overlooked, um, not just Turks that set, would settle in, in Anatolia, right? There were lots of Kurds, but also people from further north, even Slavs, right? Um, and, and this had already been going on for a while, because this frontier, if you really look at it, was as you know, quite in depth, like from Theodosiopolis to um, up to the, the the Van Lake, it's kilometers, right? They're mostly fortified areas. Again, also the the Byzantine frontier there has a very feudal uh, savor, let's say, because the uh, the the just the way they control it was in part uh, involved to the local um, nobility. Just think about pre. Um, Turkic Anatolia, how important it was for the nurturing of the Byzantine Tagmata heavy cavalry, the, the famed cataphracts, um, and so on. So these cultures are very similar, very akin to that. They, they of course, are in part, uh, as we just observed, within the Byzantine Empire themselves, but at a convenient distance. Uh, let's put it in this way. And very often they, you know, historically, even at the time of the uh, Caliphate invasion, etc., they had sided with with the Muslims, at least occasionally, right? Just w whichever interest they had there to, to rule, to go against this or that uh, neighbor, rival, and so on. Because, again, uh, there could be a, a power activating more or less from a direction or another, but the important was remaining fundamentally autonomous. At this point, however, the Caucasus itself is expanding as a as a culture, right, as a civilization, and uh, it manages to achieve a lot. And these magnificent um, knights are, uh, in many ways, the the military product of the panoply of. Uh, these warriors was substantially based, or at least shared, right, and in part also a bit uh, the other the other way around was true. There were Byzantine emperors that did have, say, Armenian origin, as you know, uh, on Byzantine armament. 
but also to a certain extent for sure on those of the say Islamic East let's put it in this way uh, as well as together with some nomadic Turkic innovations again it's obvious right uh, you are essentially from one side you have Constantinople actually very far away longitudinally but still you know actually the, the caliphate is closer but culturally you stick to to the west and there is a, a, a much deeper I mean historically speaking the the influence of the west had been uh, larger uh, in a way especially on naturally on the western part here of the Abkhaz even in part we've seen it even Alanian um, panoplies from the other side of the Caucasus just were very something similar between the, the Byzantines and, and the Rus ones um, the Rus had a considerable influence uh, on the area as well. The famous Georgian queen, actually king, she, because she was provided with this title, still monarch, male monarch, which is strange in tradition, actually, you can think about of some more chthonic sastratum. The queen Tamar, right, that first married um, a Russian prince, uh, whom she divorced, um, and who tried to also take over... Um, power locally and Georgians managed to repel them eventually she married with an Alanian things went better you know the successors you know were their children um in any case the Mongols were arriving so, you know ruining ruining a bit the the party to, to everybody uh, involved uh, there but um and and it, this tells even just the uh, this is an interesting perspective. I mean, how much more exposed we often see it for Central and Eastern Europe, but also the Caucasus were to 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 the waves of nomads. Again, in a narrowly Western perspective, you don't get these strange, you know, peoples coming out of nowhere at some point, raiding, destroying, seizing, etc. That you have to cope with constantly, right? And you can argue that that martyrological cultism that you do find scattered across this entire area. Sometimes you say, well, it's a mostly an orthodox thing. Well, not really. It's, in my opinion, it has a lot to do with, of course, the different level of, of development, the, uh, the, 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 the greater, say, in fact, uh, say, private and somehow warlike, almost tribal in certain cases, culture of some areas. But this constant hammering from Again, aside from the biblical references to, 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 the, to the monsters of Gog and Magog and so on but the, at the ends of the world, but, you know, still somebody that is there at your throat, right? You're not that spoiled to have the privilege to have always the same neighbor, like in, in the Western world, in a much more relaxed, kind of gentrified situation. It's also viciously um, hammering in of itself, right, because actually it, it is the, the strongest on a military level it's getting, especially at this point, but it, it's in this sense, the, 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 almost the too poetic the romantic background of these countries really fascinates, right, this is where the, the peoples that still until, I don't know World War I in part fought as literal medieval knights um, in, in arms and armor, yes, you would find uh, you know, a, a rifle at that point here and there, but let's say the the sense uh, still being that um, there was a, a deeper uh, allegiance, right? Even so, surely also from a religious point of view, considering the the more you know exposed also contact with with Islamic world, with the sense of being besieged, being again at this um, corner full of castles that had to withstand again the, the assaults of, of the you know, very, like the Serbians can think of, of the Ottomans and uh, other you know peoples, I don't know, of the Mongols and it, 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 it's part of the national epos it's part of this part of, of course uh, you know history goes because eventually the local peoples are very often not aware of what we're talking about in a, in a, in a truly traditional sense because they interpret a sort of strange nationalism and or socialism as a form of you know, historical tradition and that's the unfortunate outcome of um, of the fourth age and mostly of course cultures that can hardly be called like that uh, at a point everywhere I'm not making the case that you know the, the, this applies only to them, it applies really to, to the entire mankind at this point. 
Um, but it, it's also because they were hammered that hard, right? They 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 suffered. They were taken over by other peoples, which is also another sad, tragic aspect of this. And that's why also partly that sense of martyrdom and sacrifice and, after all, impending um, a doom and threat, right? Uh, eroding the, the stability of the universe is is deeper in a feudal warlike uh, world. Now, um, among going back to, to the panoply, when you look at the offensive weapons, um, you find, of course, swords, spears, javelins, maces, beautiful maces, beautiful battle axes, by the way, and those are very, again, anti-armor, as we well know. But also, given that we are, in a bit, again, in this moment of rise, you know, the... Uh, of the lower classes, but especially in the 12th to 13th century, you do find this local farmers, militias, whatever, equipped with um, halberds, right? Um, which is, um, you know, this and other composite shafted weapons telling the truth, so don't underestimate, and this is what I say, even for the steps, right, of how much infantry, and especially infantry capable of coping, with uh, a lot of missile fire, um, but also this quite heavy cavalry uh, existed there, right? It was necessary to, to the same knights to just take the field um, and, you know, being, being out there. And it naturally, I, I will make uh, that there is not a massive, let's put it in this way at least, because we will surely try to appreciate all these details in depth in other videos, but um, there's no evidence, at least from, from these areas, differently from the most kind of urbanized, commercial, and somehow statally oriented parts of the West, a, a significant infantry development uh, that can, especially, I don't know, beat cavalry, no, right? It, it's, again, hardly feudal, this halberdiers and other... Um, say troops it could be commoners mostly in this case yeah it could be just romantically especially in the earlier more primitive times saying the 10th century maybe uh, more you know uh, kind of part of a sort of local community defense system whatever more than else they were at any time under a significant control of the of the feudal nobility as well so always remember this, in any military culture, the primary, let's say, the, the primary uh, military outlook is designed to fight against your kin, right? So an identical army to your own. And um, this should always make you reflect on, again, how much of a draw that makes in a technological sense and how much more of forces at that point are really what, what matters. Um, now, we, we see also um, composite bows, by the way, this is kind of obvious, we've seen, we know it, it was the same case in, uh, um, in Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, these are areas that had seen the spread of this type of weapons in uh, antiquity, um, and that now had been prevalent, uh, no doubt. Um, Divers and elaborate items of defensive gear were also widespread. Right, uh, bell-shaped helmets sometimes had a nasal or a neck piece and were always equipped with a male tippet, which suggests both the need of having a strong, bulky, resistant kind of armor structure to defend, of course, your head, but against this, you know, mace blows or things like that, you know, there were massive swords capable of definitely uh, counting somebody's face um, in health. Um, so, but also arrows, right? There were lots of arrows around, um, counting prevalently from, say, at least in relative terms, from the steps uh, type of warfare, but that, as we've seen, was pretty much uh, the norm ever since, I think, about ancient Armenian warfare, um, you see there always those horse archers uh, on, on in a consistent in a consistent uh, way. If you think about artisan times, 
there's plenty of that. And again, I can't stress enough how influenced these people are from from the steps. Because next door they can't simply hire them. It's a bit like Hungary. Um, they can't hire the Kumans, whoever leaves across the Carpathians. Um, it, it's that easy. And and they are somehow, when settled, more dependent on the local kings even more. Because it's not just they're foreigners, but they have a completely different lifestyle. So, actually, aside from Azerbaijan, in fact, where most Turks will settle later, I made um, a bit about the Al-Qumul army organization. Uh, there were, as you know, the white ship, the, the black ship Turks, etc. We're talking about the later Middle Ages. The, the say this this region was not that good for you know for nomadic uh, pastoring right so what you find that especially in the east um that's also where you know if you go north across the Caspian Sea that's also where the the golden horde will install itself so at least those places are just next door as you understand and there are surely some you know pastors that can offer like a settlement for for other people, it would happen later with with the Turks, with other uh, peoples again called from Central Asia in Ottoman times and so on. But this was since again ancient times, a frontier era, right f f between the, the Romans and the Persians, then the, Byz the Byzantines and and the Caliphate uh, and beyond, as we have observed the, between the Ottomans and the, the Safavids at some other point. Um, and it's relatively traditionalistic, relatively conservative in kind. Because actually, the, say, the uh, the second stronger influence is at least as, after the Byzantine Christian one is the is the Persian um, Islamic one, and that is one that again until the Battle of Calderon will maintain, as you know, a much stronger kind of chivalric, feudal mentality as opposed to the modernization was really starting to kick in in some, uh, some aspects of warfare at that point. Again, the guys with halberds are not just, they existed in Persia too, but um, these kind of uh, uh, more European but by, by approximation kind of uh, social organization is produces even the more more infantry and less less cavalry comparatively to, to those guys in the east. I, I made a video about the Iranian, uh, say, is, an, an Islamic Caucasian, in fact, um, warfare a couple of months ago, if I'm not wrong, um, and we highlighted how this was the case, just as a probably as a different area within the Caucasus in, in the eastern part. Um, we find, uh, of course, uh, mail or splint armor um, at, at times, again, different layers superimposed, right? So, as we've observed, basically, for every other people around, um, the splint armor could reach the waist, uh, the hips, or the knees. So, it, it's very heavy, it's very big, right? It could be... Um, sometimes sleeveless or have short or long sleeves. This looks very much like a, a Central Asian influence, um, which um, we have observed in videos about uh, just lamellar armor or the one of, say, of the Mongols, depending on uh, even the one of Tibetan warfare. We illustrate this design that basically existed from quite a while, and from the migration era and would remain as it's anthropologically documented even in photograph up to say certain among certain Siberian peoples until the the twentieth century, things like that. Um and it suggests uh again a um very interesting thing is especially on the ground of um in part this kind of individualism, right? The sense that this type of armor is much more suited to a sort of um, prevalently mounted and somehow knightly um, combat, of course, but also th the fact that um, it has um, an anti-missile capacity, right? It, this, this thing of especially reaching down 
um, uh, to, to to the legs in 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 the covering uh, in a covering function, uh, and the uh, it, it's also part of the of, of the necessity of a greater clash, say kind of a hit absorption um, among again single combat uh, situations like this within certain uh, single combat issues that it's fooling the local epos of this kind of sense of uh, heroic championship um, etc but having this long coat fundamentally that protects you all around um, and that is the ideal especially against arrows that can arrive from literally every side so again suggesting that the guys would, would venture ahead in the attack perhaps Again, in this, to these swarms of um, horse archers would um, need extra protection while they were pushing uh, the enemy in order to break it before he, he could have the time of double enveloping them. Uh, and so receiving lots of hits from, from the sides uh, and the rear. Differently from Western warfare, that albeit being, as we've seen, quite similar... Um, was concentrating its efforts uh, mostly towards like a kind of relatively brief charge, like smashing to very solid kind of infantry, in fact, like the ones that mostly were uh, rising in, in Western Europe uh, at this point. And so not being preoccupied so much as they would be, you know, actually in the 13th century when the Mongols uh, arrived in Central Europe with this kind of further, you know, um, uh, in fact, um, say more, uh, in fact, agile elements developing like the horse archers around. In the West, there were, um, of course, horse archers, mounted crossbowmen, and made some videos about that as well. But again, um, there was arguably more, kind of more or politically and institutionally uh, compact order so that armies were just being, again, developed in a, in a very different context. Um, it, the, the impression is that, again, the Caucasian knights were somehow more, again, uh, not necessarily short-term um, uh, employed right on campaign, but, you know, it would be uh, taking part in smaller uh, contingents, and so they, they had individually this greater sense of you know, the, the individual one that, that had simply to be overly loaded against any kind of aggression, and especially this, the, unlike in the West, this massive amount of missile fire coming from the flanks, which is the flanks, the rear, right, which is something slightly different, not excessively, but slightly different for, from what happens in Western Europe. Again, I, I have to find a way to talk more often about that because it feels always we're leaving some of these aspects behind. But again, those halberd years are quite seductive because you may think that they did um, deploy at some point uh, on the uh, wings of, of cavalry as it was happening in the West together with crossbowmen, archers, or, or so on. But again, the sense is that infantry development is uh, too, um, say, minor. Uh, compared to Western Europe, and also the areas are much less documented to consider that, which is never a good sign as far as the actual development, also the local military is concerned, because civilization goes in parallel with military power. But um, there is also that problem. There is also another mentality, which is in fact a bit more the oligarchic elite, one of the average Caucasian noblemen, that after all... Uh, doesn't give a damn about uh, you know other estates because they don't quite exist, right? Also, Westerners didn't give a damn about the peasants, but they always pop out in some way or another from the sources, from the world, uh, etc. So it's it it is really a different world. Um, this structure of the armor was usually lamellar or more um, rarely scaled. Uh, which is thought in general to be better for, uh, for coping with arrow fire as well as you know. In Armenia, 
Moreover, broad lamellar, lamellar collar and articulated brassards made of horizontal bands of metal were used. Which is um, a bit the, the most advanced type, one of the heaviest one. Armenia is the say the country that is in that sense becoming heavier time at least. Um, it will be uh, absorbed eventually by the same uh, Georgian kind of uh, military development in part but so they are similar in nature but that's in fact the thing it's mostly a western most uh, thing here to have heavier stuff and be more mo less mobile in, as a, accordingly compared to, to the enemies in the east that we will see now Shields, this is also fascinating, were round or only rarely drop shaped. So the sense is, again, uh, more like the steps, where especially you have for the elite ultra heavy um, armor with a relatively poor average warrior, even though here surely the average person was much uh, richer individually than in the steps, in comparison to the steps, not because they were swimming in gold, definitely. Uh, but again, the sense is that, as we've seen, you have all this, this massive armor that even reaches your your hips or knees. So that kind of um, kind shape, kind of drop shaped shield you find in the West um, is not there, right? And also in the West, as you know, as leg armor improves, shields by the 13th century are very small, right? They just cover the the torso side all right so um this is very much like oh, this shield type is also more common in in the byzantine empire than in the west as you know even though they had doubled the same uh, the same kind of shape uh in parallel to the ottonians uh, in the 10th century um, and it derives from this general at least for for the best armor we can see that is one of the heaviest guys this type of of um of shield that again suggests it's it's a more solo guy compared to the more collectively and numerously um trained and uh, knights in in the west they have a are under a kind of larger more stable power rising especially in in the west in the west uh, of the of the continent specifically however bards were uh, say where they were surely used just we don't see them much this is also a thing that depends on how the the horseman decides to balance his own security with one of the horses but there may be uh cuz as you know horse armor is a, a traumatically expensive thing right you don't find even in the west you just a very narrow elite of knights ever had um metal armor for like an entire bard for for the horse right sham fronts yeah the th things yes and here probably plate armor starts appearing uh not completely sure but you know that's also because we don't have that overwhelming um documentation earlier than in, in the west um consider here there is a bit the problem um of uh the, that we listed for the Rus as well of Byzantine iconography being quite strong and powerful so copying armor from like 4th or 5th century uh, you know martyrological iconography and so when when you look at the archaeology on the ground it's, it's different right you see actually a much more composite reality um, as we'll see the, the Islamic part instead is just very scarcely documented and we start having much better iconographic sources in the period just after this one that is useful because at the end of the day you know things were surely not changing had not been changing much in the mean say in the previous centuries like they hadn't been substantially different but the idea i got is that as this caucasian space was very fortified was very encastelled that it would be much more frequent for these knights at some point to dismount and to storm fortresses uh, accordingly 
with stone. We've seen it in, in the video about Georgian warfare. It's really an important thing. Again, in you know, a feudal context, a lot of castles. This this is very common in a way, and with lots of you know different uh, differences in height all around, uh, tough ground. Um, it's normal, right, to just walk into places and having stones flying at you and you know needing that kind of he even heavier defense at some point. We've seen it with the helmets too. And we do get some interesting descriptions at times of certain combat in the air, even in other times, that suggest this this picture uh, as well. Surely the most important uh, factor in this apparent lack of bargaining is social and political, though, right? That, that's kind of obvious. Uh, unfortunately for that, we have even less statistical evidence, so we can't do much. But the idea is that, well, again, the elite, as an elite appears like that, we, we may think that a very, like, very few guys, even fewer in relative terms compared to the West, had that kind of hyper equipment we're, we're looking at before. So that the, the simplest reason is that, again, the average nobleman was too poor to have significant barding, even in lighter forms, right, uh, of even organic material and so on. And there may have been a different other reasons, because about the availability of horses. Uh, there were pastors for, for those, of course, scattered all over the, the, all over the Caucasian plateaus and so on. So it, it, it really depends. It can't be said with that certainty uh, we may just be tricked by the again the few iconographic sources we have because we're really relying on very few stuff right um, if we look at the eastern part uh, of Caucasus we see um, even less right can't uh, understand much fewer in fact uh, our knowledge of the weaponry and warcraft of the Islamic Caucasian Albania before the 12th and 13th century remains obscure. Um, but for after this period, as we were saying before, we do have reliable written and graphic sources that are relatively eloquent. Now, in, in this area, noble warriors played a more modest role, seemingly. Um, in the, 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 the point being... Um, Say so they do, they would always naturally form a, form heavy cavalry. They were quite similar to what we've seen in the West. But the idea is that probably the area had not been settled by many sedent, uh, many nomads, right? As before, remember this this was in part the corridor that was exploited by by the Muslims, right, to reach the Caucasus to put an end to the Khazar incursions and to even push these nomads further north, right? So before uh, the further settlement of nomads with the Mongol wave um, and beyond. Uh, the, the, the idea is that, of course, the majority of the sanitary population was even less stratified than in the West, so the, the, um, the, there was less, that it was, say, more power of the people, let's put it in this way, uh, which may have still been a more passive one of a role, right? We're not necessarily saying that this made the place stronger on average, because it, as we've seen, this this area is where the ones that essentially the Muslims had managed to control more, right? So the idea is that probably were just poor um, as such. Uh, and in fact, we see um, also which may have happened in a sort of disarming of the locals uh, through the introduction of substantial amount of gulams, so slaves, right, especially light cavalry, foot archers. And we find lighter troops in general coming from God knows where. Um, there were, this was being a frontier peripheral area uh, of the caliphate, uh, typically some say z zealous um, uh, individuals so sometimes like we don't have to, to treat them just as a bunch of herdsmen right some of them lived in cities they were actual you know they were civilized right you know but 
they would be Gazis, that is to say, properly fighters for the faith. You know that the Islamic world, generally speaking, at least in look at Western Eurasia, you have the Mesopot Mesopotamian center corresponds to the Abbasid Caliphate and other important uh, installations, and then you have all around a bunch of heretics, exiles, sects that are all agnostic, dualist, things, things like that, and they are more uh, fanatically extremistic in nature, and that's the reason why they, they live at the outskirts of civilization. For that were, by the way, uh, always ready for um, for a raid, right? Um, on this tough grounds, you find lots of hard javeliners, uh, infantrymen of some sort, again, in for the purpose of guerrilla style kind of, of fighting. In fact, we've seen that light cavalry foot archers as, as ghoulams. Um, it, it's not even so stereotypically different from the horse archers we've seen in the Armenian and the Georgian world, but those are somehow tied here. This area looks much more like probably a frontier forgotten by the same god, right? Um, for the rest, the panoply of the Caucasian Albanian uh, heavy cavalry was typical of that of the Islamic knights. They were equipped with swords and sabers, though spears, maces, powerful small bows, and protected by mail and soft kilted armor. The calf then and the uh, gazagan that are that standard in steppes culture, even I don't know, in Russia the, the, the traditional outer garments are think like in fact the calf then and the kazakhan that literally derived from from these. So that tells you how radically impacting the, 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 the nomadic steppe peoples were on, on even places like Eastern Europe. Uh, the typical armor would be the Jab Shan, uh, a type of lamellar. Uh, so again, there were substantial heavies among uh, the Caucasian Albanians. Uh, helmets were usually egg plant shaped, perhaps an indicator of lighter equipment among the elite compared to the, uh, say, widespread or, I say, heavier one that we've seen in the Christian Caucasus. Uh, so that the main concern of these helmets was for deflecting much maces um, or axe blows. There were, there were. Uh, but more sabers, as we've seen. Um, and, and so deflecting mostly a cut blow rather than, you know, a, a smashing thing into, you know, the, the, into your head just, just per se. Again, it, it's just by degree. It's not this that in, the, doesn't happen there. The, the, there were massive swords there just next to sabers as well. There is a great blend with this, even partly relics of Iranian type of, you know... Um, sword influence, right? It was straight different from the Turkic saber and so on. And again, Christian Caucasus is, is just next door, so um, there are not radical differences. But this may have been actually one. Um, and these uh, guys had half masks, however, with camel or a blind male tippet as well, which suggests, again, substantial need of defense against missile fire, but also perhaps uh, concern towards cutting blows, right? Um, so the uh, especially from you know the the, the above, uh, as the the eggplant shape would really mean, because essentially it would protect the, the cheekbones and the, the upper part right of uh, of your face uh, more than else. Uh, still heavy, heavy, heavy type of armor, and definitely it's not just the design that dictates there how kind of heavy this is. Right, it's a matter of quality of how distributed this was that would not know exactly in comparison with other countries, but um, other countries' heaviness. Let's say round shields were either large and flat or small and convex. 
this again may suggest some greater because again let's remember these are not Turks right uh, they are much more influenced by the step the Turkic step though these guys are fundamentally Iranians uh, in you know, to an important degree still and we've seen very often that in the steps frontier there is the development of impressively um, a large uh, shields like it's extensively superficially to absorb as many arrows as possible covering a bit the entire uh, greater part of the body sort of a flat camping table a bit like the pavis or at least certain because this pavis wasn't actually born like that but um, again contrary to how most people really believe that the pavis was not immediately that large um, say movable uh, piece of almost piece of fortification right the guys would bring it themselves it was mostly how it was layered and built internally there were also very small ones but here especially in these areas again the the easier and uh, way to you know to defend themselves again effectively probably also because there was less armor as we were pointing out is this one Right, this is typical also of Eastern Europe, again, everywhere where there wasn't much of a uh, material abundance per se. So again, the, the Armenians, the, the Georgians were richer than these Caucasian Albanians. Um, and well, the, the small and convex shield is, seems more like a sort of buckler, right? So it would be used probably more in combination with um, with missile weapons at that point themselves, because as we've seen, these had been these peoples had been using um, also literal Turkic gulams with, that with that lighter function, and they would start just to to imitate that more more frequently uh, themselves. So it's all uh, it all adds up. Uh, let's put it in this way. Um, drop-shaped shields were also used though right which again could be as we were saying before less armor so the need of covering especially the thighs think about on, on horseback that really does become an important concern for the uh, for a type of cavalry that is heavier uh, but not so well armored like, like in this case and this is fascinating because it tells you how Paradoxically, the, uh, the 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 Christians could afford in, Ca in the Caucasus more because they were richer. Th say the most updated, also step styles, right? At least adapted to their own local tradition that we described before, uh, and not reduced to this kind of archaisms to to protect themselves. In kind of uh, um, let's say less uh, more awkward ways. Right, because as far as the average uh, Caucasian Albanian horse archer, those guys would have just like again a small buckler, just uh, this thing tied to their band brace. They wouldn't even practically uh, join into hand hand to hand fighting on, on a regular basis, at least for their major um, employment on, on the battlefield, uh, not pursuing the enemies or something. There were lots of in-betweens, right? As we were saying before, there were lots of javeliners, a lot of sort of medium infantries that were quite insidious, um, especially in this territory. Uh, the horse cloth um, of the Caucasian Albanian horsemen covered the steed completely, was borrowed by the, uh, by the same Muslims from their European counterparts during uh, the Crusades right so it's, it's an interesting um, aspect of this uh, they probably needed it um, more again it's difficult to make comparisons with the Christian part because those were Byzantine influence in the in the icons they wouldn't represent um, padded clothing or anyway they would use that for sure um, this may have been less of a stigma because tendentially uh, it was, um, uh, again, protecting oneself from, as we've seen, arrows raining from everywhere, especially the horse. 
was a real thing we see in, in the West was pretty much the same when they came to fight in, in the Levant against the Seljuk horsemen. Well, the, the latter had already this thing because they were betrayed to their own warfare and also it's in Central Asia. So apparently it's this eastern side of the Caucasus under Islamic influence that gets this at least more clearly represented at least in the, by the sources. A characteristic trait of adornment of helmets, uh, shields and horse clothes in the areas connected with um, uh, Asia Minor was the abundant use of tassels that we find a bit across the entire Caucasus. As we are seeing at the beginning, we cannot go in depth now in the political history of this, again, perennial, perennially unstable and somehow floating system, where there are, again, some firmer centers, there is no doubt, but again, there are uh, increasing, um, you know, their sides, and they're taken over by someone else, they, they, they fragment, and then some others take them over again, I mean, it's really that cold. In any case, uh, you can argue that as a uh, as a political instrument, the fame of Transcaucasian weaponry was won not only by brilliant victories uh, of Georgia under the aforementioned Queen Tamar, right? That at some point extended her power not just over the essentially the fact of the entire region and mostly in a decentralized way, but still, but even um, beyond the Caucasus, right? Uh, at least we're using the term Transcaucasian, so it was their side at least of the Caucasus going, uh, you know, from the other one. But uh, the same Armenian kingdom of Cilicia, uh, the, the Ildan Gizzi Emirate, as you know, about this Cilician Armenians, we made. Um, uh, already a video about, especially the 13th century night, right? That we've seen it, they're substan something substantially different, right? They, they are not in the Caucasus practically. They are essentially deportees um, that were resettled by the, the, or at least refugees. Let's put it in this way, in part, um, that were settled by the Byzantines in Cilicia after the Islamic invasions, because at that time many Armenian princes had been moving away from there. And there, as you know, they established um, a, a principality and a kingdom proper that during the Crusades played a major role in the balance between the Byzantines, the Crusaders, the Seljuks. Um, so, again, uh, that's yet another interesting place that we described as far as that um, military units episode. Uh, is is concerned again about the Ilden Gizzi Emirate? I will be searching uh, some material because it's a relatively uh, less known power that I could make some other video on. Um, and all these cultures were surely um, characterized independently from their own different degree of uh, defensive gear and so on by skilled armory. And manufacture weapons, right? Um, and uh, as well as uh, fearless merchants who sold them pretty much everywhere, right? And bringing often back other fine pieces. So, um, again, even this economical picture should be deepened because, um, as we just pointed out, there were areas that surely had less. Uh, of this um, historical uh, say, crap uh, in, uh, for example, in the stamps. But you had Constantinople from the other side, you had substantially advanced feudal cultures, also as far as the, the Persian influence, um, the Turkic influence was, was concerned. So, uh, again, it's um, it all depends, and at least here we highlight, say, the, the most important... Um, elements that can somehow uh, characterize but the glory of these military cultures that deserve surely much more attention. And it's not anecdotal really to say that I want to make videos for every one of them because I always imagine like the umpteenth person who comes here for the first time and, and that doesn't know what this channel is about um, and says, oh my god, you know, you, you talk so 
um, lightly after all about um, all these people saying, oh, I will talk about this later and this, but literally because that's what we do. Again, if you've never followed me before, this is just a um, mini series, but not even mini, telling the truth, this is somehow large, but say uh, in absolute terms, not in relative ones to my usual series. Um, that are just cyclically repeating in the you know, multi-year uh, content now um, about uh, these, uh, say the like, in fact the, the most important panoplistic features and combat techniques, styles of uh, this and that people that was uh, say if not leaving but at least influence in the uh, Mostly Western Eurasian steps, like we we have gone up pretty far up to Central Asia, um, the Baikal beyond, but um, naturally the the attention is concentrated towards also what par we partly know better, right? I also started a series about Chinese warfare for those who follow me from from a while that uh, is aiming at getting a bit that Eastern perspective as well, also about these peoples, but until I thickened the ranks here, uh, and especially paved the way with this kind of uh, bigger chunks right at our more basic, more superficial, but at the same time um, uh, in fact uh, helpful as far as the you know, nobody has ever heard about I don't know, Caucasian Albania, I wonder what it is, or at least how they vote. Um, you you realize this can be helpful. And then from there on, moving, keeping to move on, again, other you know, further foundations to reinforce the whole thing with something more specialistic in nature that I also enjoy uh, doing more. But I always believe that these more general ones are very important because they... Um, like the, the more general thing is, at least if you get it right through an adequate analysis, is very telling of some broader features that sometimes not even specialists manage to, to point out, mostly because they lack a comparative capacity of analysis. Um, and they can very n uh, well know what is happening here, but they may not know what is happening somewhere else. And so they, they may just... Um, you know, miss like a, a broader logic, right? And point like this kind of descriptions we're making now of certain. I don't know. This people had this armor going down here. Of course, it's it's a stereotype, but it it does stand out. So aside from all the kind of methodological and heuristic um, debate we could have about these features, it's it's many ways also what we know. All we know for, for the fact that, uh, again, these are not places where you can simply go in and say, okay, well, we know everything. There's a very, very, very few, um, both iconographically and um, and in Britain, documentarily, right? Um, so, again, we may be here, you see, uh, I posted, after all, some interesting picture, but very often, even the same places, the same monasteries, etc., are you know, distant from the space where you would like them at least to be to visit them regularly to document to be part even of a of a broader culture that can get interested in them. Um so it's it's not an easy um task even just to to see it. When you do it, you say, well, you know, after all all this makes sense, right? This is not to rationalize everything as a military historical analysis. It, it's simply saying, look I've seen this elsewhere, and it seems to me that it means this, right? Um, and you scratch it, that there are uh, further uh, beneath, and you, you see that there are some similar, you know, uh, so there are hints right, suggesting the same thing. And so you can start, say, from this military data telling something about the politics and the society of the people without even having, uh, you know, being particularly there as far as scholarship is concerned. And so it's, um, so again, uh, 
it's a challenge, right? You don't see how I, I'm working behind. At least I'm very open about what I do and say and think like. So I just tell you, like some things I I know, some some other I don't. But I can assure you that it's very uh, uh, very remunerative because it makes you see things in a perspective that rarely today, even scholarship, and and I say that from. Uh, from personal experience, uh, you know, you 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 can't uh, professor see right, uh, you know, uh, doctor see, etc. Uh, in any case, for today, I stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise. Leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.